Welcome to Business Done Differently, the podcast about challenging the status quo, creating fans first, and changing the game in business. I'm your host, Jesse Cole, and it's showtime. Our guest today, Alan Fadden, wrote the book on innovation and then used his techniques to create global attention by selling it with his one book bookstore. His business card says, another d- author, but he has worked with 20 of the top 100 companies in the world, including having Jeff Bezos and Amazon and Disney as clients. He changed the course of my life as a 23-year-old when I heard him speak and throw $2 bills at me and everyone in attendance. He single-handedly taught me how to stand out by doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing. From having dancing players to selling Dolce and banana underwear to hosting flatulence fun nights and morning beer festivals to having a world book tour at Epcot to promote my book, Alan has impacted so many decisions I've made and countless others in the business world. So Alan, I am absolutely fired up to connect with you and have some fun together today. Yeah, it's already fun. Thanks, Jesse. (laughs) Well, I'm so excited because obviously I heard you speak many years ago and uh, was so inspired and basically the whole mindset of thinking the exact opposite. And you call it the opportunity, which I love. I want to know a little bit back uh, your background. How do you find this idea and your opportunity? Well, it was in a chair in a barber shop in about 19 God knows what. And uh, anyway, the last century. And I saw an ad and just gotten out of school. And the ad uh, showed a picture of a little tiny Volkswagen and it said lemon. And of course, lemon is the symbol for a car that's not only doesn't work now, it's never going to work. It's like, who would call their own car a lemon? I had to read the rest of this. And it's like, you know, the guy could have given me a mohawk. I wouldn't have cared because I was so into this ad. And I read the ad and it said, well, we have 1,700 inspectors in our Wolfsburg factory. And so we catch every bad car before it comes off the assembly line. And then we break it down into parts and we correct the mistakes and we build it again. So you don't get any lemons. And the lemon we're calling this car was just that one car that we caught on the assembly line and it never got out. So we pluck all the lemons and you get all the plums. And I went, oh my God, I've got to do this. What is this? And I was uh, working at a TV station at the time and the weatherman says, oh, that's advertising. That's where you make up stuff. And I went, oh my God, I want to do that. You get paid for that? Oh yeah. So I fought like crazy to get into the ad business and it was catch 22. We'd like to let you in, but you don't have advertising experience. Oh, how do I get advertising experience? Well, you work in advertising. It's obvious, isn't it? I just read Catch-22. So uh, I started my own agency at age 25. It was called Fadden as in Cat, because nobody could pronounce my name. And I thought, well, that'll help them. F as in Frank, A as in Cat. And so people still said Fadden as in Cat, Faden as in Cat, Fudden as in Cat, Fudden as in Cat. Didn't work at all. But one day my aunt called directory assistance in uh, Minneapolis. She was from Chicago. And she said, do you have a listing for an Alan Fadden? And the operator said, oh, you mean Fadden as in Cat? And at that point, I knew, wait a minute, wait a minute, I had something here. So uh, I found out that there was no way to come up with concepts. There was no single unifying principle of creativity that allowed people to come up with concepts. So I tested this thing of doing the opposite. And because I observed in about every award-winning ad campaign, there was an opposite. And then I saw it in movies where you want to make a murder especially scary Stanley Kubrick played it in A Clockwork Orange. He played it to happy music. Yes. So combining opposite elements. So I came up with a method to do it, went to work at a big ad agency, sold my agency to them. I was their creative director. We only had beginners. I taught this to them and we won 29 national awards. I said, wow, that's pretty good. (laughs) I heard one of your former guests who was wonderful, I thought, uh, this is from last June, uh, the Disney guy. Duncan Mortal, yes. Duncan, yeah. And Duncan says, where do people get their ideas to shower? Right? Mm-hmm. Number one uh, idea place. And uh, I was really tired of being so clean and having my skin so wrinkled because I would spend hours in the shower trying to get <laughs> ideas. And I thought, well, what if I had a method based on real principles that work? So, so that's- what was your first, some of your you know, crazy things you did in the beginning of an agency to create attention that was opposite? Because I want to put some practical framework for the audience here. Well, sure. Well, it was mostly applied at the time, of course, to advertising because yes. I had this little agency. And uh, yes. so nobody had ever heard of me, but I did some advertising that won 
in the Minnesota Advertising Awards anyway, best of show and best campaign. And it was for a little wine place. And it was about these grapes that are late, late picked. And it was called Noble Rock. And so I wrote a headline that said, impress your friends with rotten wine. <laughs> and uh, that helped get the agency kicked off. We were we were in a beautiful old mansion for our offices, but we were burglarized seven times. So I put an ad in the paper and it said, attention burglars, Fadden as in Cat has moved to 430 Oak Grove. <laughs> so you started drawing attention. And then you mentioned is the Vaughn Restorf effect or about that? Oh, yes. The, yeah, good one. <laughs> There's, in fact, the guy said, I'll give you $1,000 if you can prove that to me. And so I showed him all the evidence and all the Von Restorf research. And I said, where's my 1000 He says, no, I'm not going to pay you. So, <laughs> and and what, is, what does the effect basically say about being different? Yeah. So basically, we perceive all elements in a sequence. And that's the way we get our communication. Words come after words, pictures moves, film is, goes in frames, everything's in a sequence. So in any sequence, the best remembered are the first and the last element in the sequence. And it has to do with the way the brain works. So short-term memory, long-term memory. The first one gets kicked into long-term memory. So you remember it, the last one stays in short-term memory. That's why you remember the first and the last. But any element, von Restorp also found out, any element that breaks the pattern in the middle. So if you have X, 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 O, that O is going to be remembered far in excess of all the axes. So what happens is the repetitive pattern becomes the context. Yes. And then the opposite becomes the burr under the saddle that breaks the pattern that makes all the noise. So you can actually use context to set up your idea to be more powerful. So is it more important when you're coming up with kind of an ad, what's the best way you would say to stand out? So you want to sell X, you want to sell an AC unit, you're, you're a heating and cooling company, you want to sell, how would you stand that? What would be the framework you would use? Well, first thing I would look for is what's obvious. So it, it's just a simple way to go with, so let's say an air conditioner. What's obvious about air conditioners? What do they do? They, they cool They cool down the house. Okay, they cool down the house. So what's the opposite of cool? Heat. Okay, so air conditioner heats the house. How can that be, how can that be true? And generally, there's on an air conditioner, there's hot air coming out somewhere, some yes. kind of a heat exchange. You know, they say that if your car is uh, overheating, turn on the heat. Yes. Nasty as it is, turn yeah. on the heat. Yes. Okay. So uh, actually, it ties in with that exercise in the book. How do you sell refrigerators to Eskimos? That used to be the cliche. Yes. Igloos are in cold weather. So uh, what you do anyway, you'd, you'd start with heat and the way you'd sell a refrigerator to Eskimos is a refrigerator can't plug in, of course, in an igloo, but a refrigerator still insulates things. So you can uh, use it to keep your pizza warm if you get a pizza delivery in your igloo. Okay. So that's a way an Eskimo could need a refrigerator. So I would first go with heat and go from there and find a context to put air conditioning into that so uh, it could be any number of things you may uh, turn up the heat too much in your furnace and you'll need an air conditioner to cool it down or your refrigerator breaks down and uh, and you're going to need an air conditioner to keep your food cool until you can get a new refrigerator in so it's just messing around with the general general principles and their opposites and what you're doing is bouncing back and forth between hot and cold yes you know another way to sell a refrigerator to an eskimo is who says that eskimos have to stay in the north pole you know, one of them could move to Phoenix and uh, live in a condo instead of an igloo. And uh, how hard would it be to sell a refrigerator if they didn't have one? Yeah, I love it. It's almost usually the opposite way that it could use it. Like when you start saying the AC, I was like, hey, you know, to keep all your food cold, you know, use this unit. And it just doesn't make any sense, which again, right. Al, you talk about this. I mean, you have a chapter in your book or in the book says, be a d all right. Yeah. <laughs> Which obviously, I volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> and you've even put this on your business card. I got to know for the people that listen that we may have just lost on that, that right there. What is, how does that work? Like, how, like what have you done to say, all right, this is going to stand out. This is going to be different to create attention by being a. D yeah. Well, great one. So basically part of being a d is doing something nobody else would do. Yes. And so uh, Jesse, uh, welcome to the club because I know that you have done a lot of things that nobody else would do. You know, we, our business paradigm is that we think we need to do something somebody can't do. So we need a technological edge. Well, you know, there are only so many technological edges. So do something somebody won't do. So for example, the yin and the yang, you're familiar with that, the little circle with the black area and the white area. 
there's a little dot of its own opposite. So the field of black has a dot of white, and a field of white has a dot of black, and that's to show that everything contains its own opposite. So when you're trying to come up with something, think about this. With that yin and yang in mind, the theme of the another boring derivative piece of business book is that stupid is the new smart. And so everybody's going to say, well, wait a minute, that's, that's idiotic. Where's the data? Okay, here's some data. How many new businesses fail? What's a loose percentage? You know, new like products? 90 90%, 95%. Well, what does that mean? Is everybody trying to do stupid things? No, everybody's trying to do smart things. There are a lot of smart ideas that fail. So, and I'm going to start like sounding like Seinfeld, right? <laughs> so, if a smart idea can fail, doesn't that mean a stupid idea could succeed? Okay? So, I don't know what the numbers are because not that many people do stupid ideas. But you've done a lot of what somebody might call stupid ideas, and they've succeeded wildly. Oh, yes. So I would say there's, a, there's an unspoken high percentage of stupid ideas that can make it. And what you need to do with any stupid idea, of course, is make sure it doesn't kill people. Yes. <laughs> and uh, get as many of the, uh, the dumb things out of it as possible, the things that you know are going to whack you right away. Yes. And that's why, as part of the book, uh, I invented the hoodoo method, which is handing the idea off to the right person so that you can get the flaws out of it, but the idea stays alive yes. in the meantime. You can deflaw it without killing it. Yes. All right. Go into that, the hoodoo method. That's fascinating. So this is based on the idea that people have core natures, and that's not your personality. You know, your personalities, are you outgoing? Are you, uh, are you an introvert? And so forth, Myers-Briggs and all that. This is more based on, are you an early adopter or a later adopter? 110 years of research into diffusion of innovation as a marketing tool. Everybody talks about it. Simon Sinek talks about it, but it's been around for 110 years. Now, that's about how we buy things. I took that into the company and said, well, wait a minute. Maybe we buy ideas the same way we buy products. Mm. And if you think about it, most products are ideas. They're just made manifest, whether it's a service, which is intangible, or a product that is tangible. So why not let people classify themselves and say, you know, here's who I am, here's what I love to do. So we took early adopter, those are the people who want the new ideas, but they don't want to do the details, and the late adopters who are great at the details, you need them to finish things, but they don't want that new idea coming in and messing everything up. People are talking about that in companies. A lot of uh, training people and HR people, oh, yeah, I was, you always go to the early adopters to get innovation done. So I'm in the back of the room, and I always raise my hand and say, how do you know who they are? And they say, well, we don't. That, we haven't got, gotten that far yet. So this tells you who the early adopters are, the later adopters are. Then it also tells you whether a person is a thinker, naturally, or a doer. Like, I'm pure thinker. You know, I'll, I'll do a crazy idea, but don't ask me to get it done. Oh, I got a whole, I got ideas, got a museum of ideas that just lay there hoping to get it done. Uh, can I share one of them with you? Uh, yeah, let's go into it. Yeah. Okay. So I was looking at the technology market and uh, everybody's trying to sell things to the millennials and the Gen Z and all the people who are most likely to adopt technology, right? Everybody's chasing after that crowd. So I said, okay, now who'd be the worst possible market segment? Right? Yeah. People like me. The older people, yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm older than dirt, but I'm also the guy who sat in line for eight hours to buy the first iPhone in 2007, only to find out I'd paid $200 too much for it. And I didn't care because I loved it anyway. So why not have something that honors older people and makes technology easy for them to adopt, but only in areas that will benefit them and make their lives better? simple niche kind of a market. Yes. So it's called geezerware. And uh, the idea is this, uh, the lead product is free. It's an app and you can download it. And this is, of course, is lying around on my floor here. I need, I need all kinds of things to get this done. And first of all, I need an advancer to get the thing done, to, <laughs> to make the thing work. Anyway, the first product you downloaded, it's free and it's called, why did I come into this room? If you know people who are getting along in years called the senior moment and everything. Yes. You walk down the hall. By the time you get to the end of the hall, you open the door to the bedroom. And why am I here? What did I, what was I coming in here for? So uh, 
this would use existing technology. It would just record your voice. The minute you start your trip down the hall, you say, hey, Siri, or whatever it is, and you say, I'm going to the bedroom to look for the remote. <laughs> so you get into the bedroom and you say, why did I come into this room? And then the little electronic servant comes on and replays your statement. Now, why isn't this invented? This seems like a necessity. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now what's the business model? It's brilliant. <laughs> In the, in, the, in the field of duh, it's brilliant. <laughs> so what you can do is if the remote is not in the bedroom, now a remote's not a good example because now you can find your remote or your DVR yes. will make it, but right. let's say it's a remote or let's say, so if it's not in the bedroom, you can download this other app, which is where the hell did I put that? That's what that's called. <laughs> so what you did is two days ago when you put the remote on the coffee table because your hands were full and you were trying to get some dishes back to the dishwasher, you say, I'm putting a remote on the coffee table. And then again, you would say, where the hell did I put that? I'm putting the remote on the coffee table. So geezerware. Geezerware. Done. Perfect. Yeah. And so it, it is using that mindset a little bit of like, all right, everyone's trying to go the young, the young, young. I'm growing after the old in a different way, using something that already exists. You mentioned it's combining elements too, right? Absolutely. Arthur Kessler said it best in uh, The Act of Creation, 1961. He says, we don't create. Everything's already created. We combine. Yes. So we take elements. I we love it. El go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, it makes me think like of when you look at things that wouldn't work. Like, for instance, I think about our, our morning beer festival. You drink beer at night. You don't drink beer in the morning. And when we hosted the morning beer festival, everyone was confused at first. Are they really doing this? Why are they doing this? And we, I love it. And we only sold about 100, 200 tickets. But next year, it sold out. And because the people <laughs> that came, they told everyone that they were drinking beer at 8 a.m. on a baseball field. And it's that opposite effect. A baseball team sells t-shirts and hats. They don't sell underwear, Dolce and banana underwear. And we sell with a big <laughs> banana on the crotch and a small banana on the crotch. And it <laughs> sells the small banana dramatically. And How so beautiful. These are some of the ideas and concepts. And I want to share some more examples from you because I think it's so fascinating to say, all right, this may be a stupid idea on the outside, but you know what? It'll get people talking that may make it stand out amongst all the Me Too's. I think of some of the things that you've done. Obviously, the one big book bookstore, which, Alan, I got to say, I've shared on stage your story of that probably about 100 times at this point. So um, I might have sold one or two books. So hopefully that happens. Thank you. But in regards to even the wine event you did, I remember the wine event, the <laughs> wine slobbery. Can you share that and maybe the suck -ass posters? I want to give the context of some of these things that you've done to say, look at the opposite of way it's done, and let's just do it the complete different way. Yeah, great one. So uh, let's start with the success posters, spelled S-U-C-K-C-E-S-S. <laughs> -S -S. And by the way, I was doing that work in Santa Barbara. I came up with that idea, and I was at one of those internet, this is 1995 maybe, I was at an internet coffee shop, yeah. and the guy who was the tending the uh, internet part of it goes and he goes to shut down my computer and he sees what I was doing and he goes and he registers a domain name success.com s-u-c-k-e-c-e-s-s -S. fortune magazine was writing this up about five years later and the reporter calls me and screams at me because the the website I gave her got her to a porn site this guy <laughs> made a porn site out of it and uh, I said, I never gave you the website. She said, oh, maybe I looked for it. But why is that a porn site? And I told her. And she said, okay. So, we, so, so listeners, we will not look this site up. But about no, the, yeah, do not go there. But let's go to the posters. So, uh, and, and the point was, I think one of the great stimulations for change is if you don't like something. And I didn't like those successories posters very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought, you know, it's like somebody buys a bunch of posters and hangs them up in the office. At worst, it's like, well, now I don't have to talk to anybody. I can they, go get motivated by this poster. You know, it says, I just didn't like it at all. And as a pure creator, the revenge of a creator is not to attack something. It's to satirize it. Yes. And so I thought, well, what can I do? And so I did the almost the exact same look. But nonetheless, if you want to, the law encourages parody, but always change something because you don't want to look like you're trying to capitalize on their trade dress. You'll lose a lawsuit. Yes. Sorry, legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> cancel, cancel. Anyway, so I came up with a demotivational poster, which showed beautiful blue skies. And then it said, 
Give up. You're a loser. No motivational <laughs> is going to change that. So uh, we faxed it. <laughs> that's all you could do in those days to recycled paper products. And they uh, faxed us back a five-year contract and they turn uh, down about a thousand ideas a week, or they did at the time. So uh, came up with a whole bunch of different ones and it sort of became a thing. And then somebody saw what we were doing. And the, when Fortune did the article, there's a despair.com thing. And this is a guy who knocked us off completely and even copied our trade dress. Oh, geez. So he was doing like $7 million a year because he, he was on the internet. And what did we do? We sold him his greeting cards and they put him in malls. Oh, jeez. Uh, you know, so we're selling business stuff to housewives. You know, it's just completely, I love it. you know, that's why we need all of us. People yeah. who say, no, 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 don't do that. You don't want to be in uh, suburban shopping malls. Yeah. Well, it's the power of, it's the power of parody. You're like, all right, everyone is seeing this. And it's like, all right, people appreciate that, but let's just poke fun at it. And then people like that kind of like it, but kind of don't like it. They run to that. I want to give a, a few more examples because I'm trying to, I think a lot of us are parallel thinkers. We see that idea and it's like, all right, can we use that as well? So mention the wine event again you did. Oh, yes. So I used to have these things called mystery parties where I would rent a school bus and, you know, put a keg in it and some cheap wine. And we take people to group belly dancing lessons. And we did a parody of a Bowling for Dollars with Bowling for Nuclear Weapons. And so one of the things is... I, this is in Minneapolis, and the 510 Groveland was one of the best restaurants in town, like a five-star restaurant, and they were my client, and so I arranged with the owner to have a wine tasting, and we sat everybody down, and we brought them in in the school bus, unloaded them, we had the private room, the waiters are wearing tuxedos, carrying around silver trays, three glasses in front of you with a rating card, bouquet, body, and so forth, the five things that you'd rate a wine on during a tasting. And we're all ready to go. And then they said, and now the wines. And they bring in these three bottles of wine. And one was Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill. Uh, another one was Annie Green Springs. And the other one was uh, Mogan David 2020, also known as Mad Dog 2020. <laughs> and so they were all for the uh, marijuana crowd. These were all these totally sweet wines that would get the taste out of your mouth. And so they're cheap as possible wines. And then we went through the exact, you know, swirling it around to see if it was a full bodied or not. And we kept the pretense up all the way. And then you always have like French bread to clear the palate, maybe a little pate. And so again, the, and the waiters come in the tux of the silver trays and on the trays was premium saltine crackers and cheese whiz. Very festive from the people at Kraft. Uh, so, I love it. Well, the idea that, you know, the nicest possible gala you could have serve food and drinks that would never be served at that gala. And it becomes remarkable for people and they laugh. Absolutely. Now, one of the things you want to do is as part of this is, you know, we talked about content and context. Yes. Well, the content was the cheap wines. The context was the five star restaurant. So what you want to do is pick one rule to break which is instead of having great wines, have awful wines yes. and then keep everything else the same because you have control of both the content and the context. And, okay. and the juice is not in so much what they are, but how they relate to each other. And the further you can pull them apart, the more powerful the idea is. And the reason is that perception is a constant. You know, you understand something when you understand it. So it's sort of like there's, oh, I'll give you an example, a hand clap. Yes. If the elements are close together, I can't make too much noise when I clap my hands. You know, put your hands almost together and clap them. It's very faint. But if you take your hands way far apart and clap them, it's, I think I just hurt myself. <laughs> it's much more powerful. And that's what you have control of. You don't have control over time. You have control over space. So you yes. make distance between the elements. And break one rule. So like example, one idea, I have an idea book. I'm sure you do too at some point. The idea box yeah. that I got from Mike. And so I write 10 ideas every day. And one that just came in context of this was our bathrooms are 1926 ballpark, Allen. Like we have a 1926 stadium. It's an older stadium. The bathrooms aren't the nicest. Yes, you know, our rivals, the Macon Bacon. So we have Macon Bacon urinal cakes that our fans are pissed <laughs> about. But it's an older bathroom. So one yeah. idea I wrote was one stall create the golden throne. And it's the nicest stall ever assembled. Like literally, you know, <laughs> you have the bathroom attendant. It's, it's like, looks like it's on gold. It's perfectly manicured. There's marble in inside it. And it's like, 
you wouldn't expect to walk into a bathroom and then all of a sudden like, what is that? Is that kind of what you're saying, the dissonance between the two? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Pick out the worst. Again, you have the worst possible context. I imagine there are certain times, uh, for example, you could be uh, standing there at a urinal when Babe Ruth hit his 60th home run in 1927 or whatever it was. Yes. You know, there's a bunch of things you can do with that too, but then I wouldn't ever do two ideas at once. I think your golden throne is a beautiful, and beautiful so, opposite. So poke fun sometimes at the situation. You really kind of poke yes. fun at it and just go the opposite route. And you wrote like, find what's funny and apply it to your business. Be silly. If it makes you laugh, it could be a revenue generator. And so is that yeah. kind of like the mindset? So yes. you look like sometimes is a lens like, does this make me laugh? Right. Right. And if you tell an idea to somebody and it, and it makes them laugh, you know you're on to something and it's like, okay, now how do we make these opposites work together? Because when they don't work together, it's exactly the same principle as humor. It's joke. You laugh because you're releasing energy because the elements don't fit together. You got The energy that you get from that perception has to go somewhere. So you got ha-ha if it doesn't fit the two elements. And if they do fit together, you got ah-ha. Yes. And usually my ideas are so dumb that people will laugh and then they'll wait a minute and they'll say, hey, uh, may, well, maybe that could work. Yes. yes. You know, but some it, people do. It reminds me of this past season, instead of the seventh inning stretch, we had the second inning stretch. And instead of a stretch, we've got a Richard Simmons like character that came out and just started thrusting and dancing and having the whole stadium dance, which wasn't stretching. And it was in the second inning and people were very, very confused, but it's that same, like, Hey, people are used yeah. to it this way. Do it this way. The second inning contraction as opposed <laughs> to the stretch, right? <laughs> Weightlifting is contraction. And so is Richard Simmons. So. <laughs> That's amazing. All right. So we, I'm going to break it up a little bit here. We're going to have, yeah. we're going to have a second inning stretch. All right. Right. Alrighty. And we're going to play a game. And this game is truth and dare. Which one would you like first? Okay. Well, you know, I've never played that game. Ever? Because well, I, ever, because I'm too old. So uh, I have to, if it's truth, I have to tell the truth about something. And if it's a dare, what? You're going to have to do something. Oh, cool. All right. <laughs> well, truth. Let's start with truth. All right, true. Give me one of the funniest, maybe not most outrageous failure you had with a crazy idea that you've done. Something that stands out, a funny failure uh okay uh, well let's see i had a couple i had a client tell me once he said he took me to lunch after we were all done with our ad campaign and he said fadden if you were my lawyer i'd be in the electric chair <laughs> what did you do well it wasn't that great of an idea it was for burgess batteries which was owned by Gould, the Minnesota company, and they were trying to get in the consumer market and they didn't have much money. And so they decided to do an outdoor campaign. And I helped them with that. That's a good thing always to do if you don't have much money because it stays up for like 30 days or so. And people, you know, you get a lot of reps. Anyway, so uh, it said something like, uh, it's 10 o'clock, is your battery still awake? Something like that. And so eh, it is all right. But uh, what I did was I wanted to have the most beautiful photograph of a battery ever taken and the most beautiful printing job. So since I was managing that, I spent all the money on photographing the battery and printing the posters. And the only part was he didn't have any money left in his budget to run the advertising. <laughs> so it's like, OK, there's a lesson. I don't think I should manage the implementation of anything because that would be much better done by an advancer and a refiner, for yes. example, on, on which, my model. Which I want to get into it a little bit. That's a good example of your guy, probably the most self-aware. I know you have some other funny moments. We'll get into those later, but I think that was good. Are you ready for your dare? Yes. All right. This is a game we do at the ballpark. It's called Sing Off. We put 2,000 fans in one grandstand against 2,000 fans in the other stand. We play a song. When it finishes, you have to finish that song lyric. Okay? Okay. And this song... You should know this one. It's well, do, do I have to do it accurately or can I make it up? Uh, you can make it up, but you may know it. You may know it. Are you ready? All right. Yep. Here we go. One, two, bring it to the folks. Snoop Dogg and Dogg and Dr. Dre is at the door, ready to make an entrance. So back on up before I have to start ripping shit up. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Give me the mic first so I can buzz like a bubble. Compton and Long Beach, you know you're in for trouble. Ain't nothing but a G thing, baby. Uh, I'm so glad you still got yeah. it. I'm still glad you got it. 
All right. No one, I think, will ever, ever, ever sing nothing but a G thing on this show. But you did, and you knew it. Can you explain why you actually know that song? Well, well, my sons loved that song. <laughs> and so I decided to learn it. My favorite part was when Snoop Dogg sang capital S-O-S and double O-P, D-O-double G-I, <laughs> D-O-double G-Y, D-O-double G, you see? And uh, so I would go to karaoke places. And, you know, I look like an accountant. <laughs> and it's like this old guy who was an accountant up there singing Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre. And people would stop everything. There wouldn't. You could hear a pin drop, you know, except for my singing. Everybody stopped whatever they were doing. To look at this stupid thing. So that was a great, that was a great setup. Well, but what I love, <laughs> that, was, that was your entrance song for a lot of your speeches, correct? Well, a few yes. of them. Yes, yes. Which is, I mean, you can't go that far because some of it gets a little, the language gets a little offensive. <laughs> but I, I saw a speech and I remember you came in like that and you're dancing and again, I mean, I don't know how old you were at the time, but you weren't very young. And to come out to that song and hip hop dancing is immediately like that is living your brand. That is doing the exact opposite of what people would think. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, that, that, that was fun. Which is so funny. All right. All right. There, there, I know we can do stories for a while, but I want to go into a little bit of the care model because I think so many people listening is like, I can't come up with all these ideas. You know, think of the opposite, combine. I don't know how to do this. Share with me this care model, because I think almost every company should look into this, and we're going to do it completely as a team. You and me are creators. We'll think of ideas, uh, but yeah, good, luck. good luck after that a lot of times. We have to work hard to get them executed. Share, share the model. So basically, there are early adopters and later adopters, as I said before, and there are thinkers and doers. And if you put those two together, if you have somebody who is a thinker and an early adopter, that's a person who says, ideas are us. And so the acronym is CARE, C-A-R-E. The original name of the assessment was Innovate with Care. Mm -hmm. So C is for creator, early adopter, thinker. Now, creators are great at thinking outside the box, all the cliches, coming up with the great ideas. However, that's pretty much it. It's <laughs> like, okay, I'm done now. And, you know, well, uh, how about getting it done? Well, let me think of some more ideas. It's like stuck. It's like a broken record kind of a thing. So the advancer. And that's only 15% of the population is an early adopter doer. Very unique person. No other model will identify that person. That person can look at 10 ideas and say, we ought to do number seven, but we've got to do number nine first because number nine drives number seven. Give me that. I'll get it done. I'll get a launch plan all done. That's a person who selects the best idea and plans it out and makes sure it gets done. That's a person who says, don't worry about money. I got a budget over here. And I know exactly the people we can take this to. So this is a person, I'm trying to collect the whole set. I'm finding every advancer I can. So then there's a person who's a later adopter and a thinker, and that's called a refiner. A refiner is a person who can tell you, they can see around corners and tell you what's going to go wrong. Oh, that's not going to work. Here's why. And so you never let a refiner or anybody kill an idea. An idea is an off-balance sheet asset of the company. Therefore, they're valuable. You don't want to destroy them. So instead, you make the refiner tell you exactly, be specific, everything that can go wrong, you make a list. Then you take that list, the advancer takes that list back to the creators. You keep the refiners and creators out of the room. Never have them in the room at the same time because they're going to fight. And they're going to get all emotional and the whole thing is destroyed. So uh, you take the refiner's objections, and objections are just simply ideas too. You say, okay, it's illegal in 18 states, what are we gonna do? So the first thing a creator says is, oh, wait a minute, doesn't that mean it's legal in 32 states? A lot of them will say, doesn't that mean it's legal in 45 states? Because everybody's math impaired these days, <laughs> but you get the idea. So why not launch in the 32 states and then we'll lobby in the other 18 because laws change. So now you've got a rollout for 50 states. So that's the kind of thing. Every objection can be overcome, rarely, but occasionally there's one that kills the idea. And you say, well, I'm glad we didn't do the idea. It would have put us out of business. Yeah. But, you know, you want to know. Yes. So uh, then there's an executor, and that's a person who just says, leave me alone. I'm going to do the details. Don't you dare bring an idea in here. That's going to upset everything. I'm going to have to time my coffee break at a different time. And we need all of us, though. 
from start to finish or natural starters, natural finishers. Why not have the people involved at the right time instead of involving everybody in everything? If you have a team that runs a relay race, it does no good to tie all four of the runners' legs together and have them run the whole thing together holding the baton. They're not very fast that way. And so you said 85% of people usually want to kill an idea. Explain that. Okay, so let's do the math again. 100% minus 15% is 85. It's the advancers who want to keep a good idea alive. Okay. Okay. So 35% of the people are creators. They will kill your idea for a very simple reason. It wasn't my idea. Nice idea. I've got six others and we're going to do mine, okay? And uh, so there's uh, 35%. Another 25% is a refiner. Eh, it has too much wrong with it. You know, you can't do that. Are you out of your mind? Are you smoking something? Are you nuts? And then the executor, another 25% will kill an idea because it's too disruptive. Oh, we can't handle that. We'd have to change the filing system for God's sake. What's wrong with you? So you've got 85% of the people trying to kill your idea. No wonder you don't want to be in meetings with everybody there all the time. It makes no sense. Because then nothing gets moved forward because everyone's clashing. Clashing, killing ideas, coming out madder than hell or upset or I don't remember who said this, but it's like uh, never criticize a fish for its inability to climb a tree. Mm. Well, we criticize fish for their inability to climb a tree every day in every meeting. Mm. And we don't need to do that. It, it's so interesting. I love this. I want to go a little bit deeper on it. When I come up with an idea, I've started now thinking like a refiner because I know of all the things that they're going to start going against. I'm like, well, no, this won't work. And they still, it's interesting because I know my wife, I love her to death, but she's always thinking of like, well, Jesse, this could cause some problems. You got to be careful. Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, put a zip line across the field in the middle of the game and have people zip lining in the middle of the game. Well, no, we can't do that. They might get hit. They might do this. So what is the step to these dumb ideas, which could be great ideas, what is the best first step for a company to make something happen? Well, it is to have the idea. First of all, there's a great opposite. The bigger the idea you have, the less it will take to implement it. Yeah. And we, we proved that again and again with our Titanic game. People didn't have to die. Because if you do an incremental job, that means you've got a thousand details to do. Every idea launches a thousand tasks, okay? So for example, in the Titanic, if you are deciding to equip the lifeboat so they can hold more people, then you gotta get carpenters out and the ship's gonna sink in two hours. How are you gonna do that? Incremental ideas require a lot of implementation to make them work. Oftentimes, the more radical the idea, the less implementation. So, so, so like, so like the, the no attendance game that Mike and you guys did in Charleston. Yes. It's like, no one's ever done that. That's very big, crazy, but it probably wasn't a lot of work. <laughs> No, exactly. And it was profitable, too, in a lot of ways, because they, they didn't have to, there was so little they had to do, you know what I mean. Yeah, and it got Staff great, great attention, which sold more merchandise, got more people coming to games, etc. Absolutely. And so, like with the Titanic, why did the ship have to sink? What you do is you do the opposite. You hit an iceberg, you feel shame. Now you say, oh, I'll never hit another iceberg again. That was terrible. So why not, while the ship is still operational, turn it up full speed, head right for an iceberg, and strike it head on, okay? What'll that do? That'll hold the ship into place, and there's tremendous upward force on icebergs, and so yeah. even if the compartments fill up with water, the ship's not going to sink, and then you just keep partying. You know, it's so, a new so ending what, for the movie. So what the captain should have done and said, no, let's hit the next one. <laughs> yeah, that's right, but hit it head on. Hit it head and, on. Hard. And the refiner's Actually, in meetings, oh, that's ridiculous. You'll, you'll ruin the ship. You'll sink the ship. Well, number one, it's sinking anyway. Number two, in 1910, there was a ship that accidentally hit an iceberg head on, couldn't back out of the iceberg, and wound up sailing into New York Harbor, pushing an iceberg. Oh, wow. That's unbelievable. So, where has, has companies got held back here? Like if you've worked with lots of companies, you've done the assessment, hey, so if they go on, they find out whether they're creator, they're advancer, they're refiner, or they're an executor, what holds people from the next step? From adopting it. Well, they don't use the method to adopt the method. <laughs> so we need, you need an advancer to help make this happen. 
Oh, absolutely. Because people look at it and say, oh, that's nice to know. I'll just put that in my file with my personality profile and my Minnesota multiphasic. And thank you very much. I called back one of the largest companies in the world. I did a full day session with their executive team. And I said, I haven't heard from you guys. How are you doing? He said, oh, we use it every day. I said, what do you do? He says, oh, Pete over there is an advancer. You should take this idea to Pete. I said, okay, well, that's good. I'm glad that you've got this. And that's the farthest most people get. They get to like first grade and they Mm -hmm. think, okay, we're done now. It's sort of like, it's hard to break up people's thinking. But if you actually made a plan to implement it, using the method, then it'll work. I'm just curious and fascinated. Jim Collins shared about how he went in with Amazon and Jeff Bezos and shared the flywheel and how that concept works for them. When you were working with either Amazon or Disney or some of these groups, what did you notice about, because you look at Amazon and Disney, constant innovation, new things that they're doing. What did you notice about that group or those groups or 3M, another group that's unbelievable at innovation. Some of the big companies you work with, what did you notice about how they work together as a room? First of all, Jeff's group, that's his executive team, yes. Bezos, has nine of the 12 are creator refiners combination, and so is Jeff. Now, Jeff's like the smartest guy in playing games. He solves every game in about 10 seconds. And then he has a laugh. Like if you hear him laugh in a movie theater, you're going to start laughing because he laughs so loud and it's... It's one of those crazy laughs, if you know what I mean. Yes. (laughs) So he laughed at everything. And it's like the break. I said, what is this? And everybody said, yeah, it's the way he laughs. So what you're talking about is you can predict somebody's approach to innovation. And what I like to do is contrast Amazon with Apple. Hmm. You know, Jeff Bezos' mission was to be the best bookstore on the Internet. That was his mission. And he pulled it off with a market cap like, I don't know, eight, ten times better than Barnes and Nobles, who had 400 stores and so forth in the first internet bubble. So he's an incremental innovator. It's about logistics. They make their systems better and better and better. And it's slowly, it's inch by inch, row by row, we will watch our garden grow. Then you look at Steve Jobs, who was, now I didn't work with Steve Jobs directly, but I profiled several of the people who reported to him and asked who they thought Steve was, and absolutely a creator advancer, mostly advancer. And so he would be the guy who'd make sure this got done. And what did he say? His mission was make a product that's insanely great. Yes. Now, it's quite different from being the best bookstore on the internet. Once incremental, Steve Jobs is radical innovator. But Jeff Bezos, I mean, he's done so many big, big innovations, but you're saying is maybe that constant, incremental, most customer-centric company. I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to keep doing this, following that. And they turned into big innovations, but it was years of just trying to create a better customer experience. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, we're talking, uh, what, 25 years, a little more than 25 years that he's built this thing. They weren't even profitable for like, I don't know, the first 15 years. 100%. So you mentioned games that Jeff was laughing at constantly in the group. What type of games were you talking about? I'm very intrigued. Well, we played the Titanic game, and Jeff immediately got all the answers. I mean, he's that big of a thinker, but he's very... So you're the captain of the Titanic. I didn't invent this game. I just twisted it and modified it. You're the captain of the Titanic. You've hit an iceberg. The ship is going to sink in two hours because the hull is breached. And they're only lifeboats for half enough people. You've got to save everybody. You can't let anybody die. The SS Carpathia is four hours away. You've got to figure out they're going to rescue you. They're already sent out an SOS. They're on their way. But what are you going to do two hours after the sink, the ship sinks to keep everybody warm and dry and alive until, you know, without a, two hours without a ship in the cold North Atlantic? Good luck. Take a team. Go. So you, the groups got together at this point? Is it a group? Yeah, so, th- so we put together teams and we put them together in a uh, perfect order of so many creators, three creators, one advancer, three refiners or refiners or executors. So you got the early adopters, the late adopters, and you got the advancer moderating the whole thing. We teach them the process. So then they figure out how to save the people. And some people will come up with the outrageous ideas. 
And some people will stick with the incremental ideas, but they get it done in 22 minutes time elapsed. So wow. that's over a period of, in other words, 45 minutes, but the other 23 minutes is instruction. Okay, now here's what you do. Teaching them how to do the team. Then the advancer gets one minute to pick the best idea after a brainstorming session. One minute. And you know what? They have time left over. Wow. Because they know obviously what the best one is. And so at, at Amazon, so Jeff had a lot of the best answers and he pushed it forward. Like, what did you notice? Do you remember that meeting? Oh, yeah. He pushed it forward, but he was more than that. He was just coming up, blurting out the ideas. Well, what if we did this? How about this? <laughs> he, was on, he was a guy who knew how to be in his creator and was very smart and very creative. And then at the same time, he also had a well-developed refiner, which is like, let's not do anything crazy here. Wow. And we're not going to do crazy, wild stuff to grow Amazon. We're going to do things that are well thought out. Wow. Because you know? there are big disasters if you're in logistics, right? I love it. Did you notice anything with Disney? Well, I did uh, Disney's online group, and we did it over distance on a conference call. I did like a two-hour workshop with them. Wow. And not a lot. I mean, they have a history of that, but I don't think that this online group was new. And okay. I don't think the culture had been exactly infused into them. Yeah. And in 3M, you know, I was creative director of their ad agency. This is where I developed all the opposites. We had 22 divisions of 3M, Scott's brand tape, all yeah. of their business products and everything. And that's a culture that is innovative. But, you know, everybody fights a battle. It's a battle everywhere because the process is so damaged. Yes. And so the key is to know who you are, which most companies probably don't know. And then the next step is who do you need to work with first to get to the next step? Right. Give you, give you an example of 3M. This is a legendary story. 3M got in the Brazier business in about the 50s or 60s. <laughs> and they have a penchant for action. It's like an advancer company. They don't think about a lot of things. They just do them. Their scientist gives them this stuff and boom, off they go. So they found out that the Braziers were breaking down after washing. So they had to take them all back. Now they got a half a million Braziers. They don't know what to do with it. And they're getting nowhere. So they bring in this guy who's a creator. And he looks at that and he says, okay, I heard what the problem is. And yeah, here's a lot of Braziers. You're wondering what to do with. But I don't see 500,000 Braziers. I see 1 million cold weather face masks. That's what they used it. That's what launched the face mask business for 3M. <laughs> Unbelievable. So it was just seeing it differently. Seeing it differently. And then because they were already an advancer kind of a company, they said, yeah, we're doing this. Oh. That's, that's a big one. Yeah, I think in Built to Last, Jim Collins talked about 3M does a lot of stuff and they keep what works. They just try a lot of stuff and keep what works. Is that, I mean, obviously in minor league baseball that you've been involved in, we've been, that's pretty much the name of the game. Just what are you willing to test? Absolutely. And do it all. Set some priorities, but do, and, and I would do some of the more outrageous ones first. Use your refiners to help think it through. Yes. Now, can I tell you a quick story of what didn't work? Yeah, I'd love to hear the things that didn't work. There's been a lot on my list too. Yeah. <laughs> So we had a working with a team in AAA team in Portland, the Portland Beavers. And the mayor at the time said, now we're hiring you guys because you do crazy stuff and we want some national publicity. So you got to do something that really gets the attention. So they were managing the team and it was going along. And the mayor said, hey, you're not doing anything that's getting attention. So Mike couldn't do anything. So he sent me out there and I sat there and worked with them for a couple of days. Came up with one idea that I liked a lot, but, uh, you know, I didn't hear any more about it. And then a couple weeks later, I'm in the Seattle airport and I look up and CNN. Now, this is during the Enron scandal. Yes. And I don't know if you remember, but Arthur Anderson is the company that was accused of falsifying the records. Yep. The idea was Arthur Anderson Appreciation Night. So I look up uh, at CNN and they're doing uh, Arthur Anderson Appreciation Night. And I look over at ESPN over on the other monitor and they're doing Arthur Anderson Appreciation Night. So, oh, I guess, they, I guess they released the idea. And here was the deal. Why would you do something like that? That's a terrible idea. So the idea was it cost you $10 to get into the game, but it cost you $5 to get into the game, but we would give you a receipt for $10 for tax purposes. Then 
in every section there was a free shredder. So if you had incriminating papers at home, you could bring them to the ballpark and get rid of them in a safe way, no matter what section you sat in in the ballpark. So it was a close to an attendance record. <laughs> they obviously sent camera crews, the networks did, but there was one small problem. That was they got 2,000 angry calls and emails. And there was a guy at the, their parent team, the San Diego Padres, who had to take all the calls. And one day I get a call from me. He says, Fadden, you're going to buy me lunch. And it's going to be very expensive because I've had to answer 2,000 emails and calls because of your promotion. So we went and I thought he was going to kill me. And we went and had lunch. And so we made peace. But I said, well, how did you handle it? And he was brilliant. He said, first thing I did is I said, okay, what's the problem with the promotion? Oh, it's heartless. It's so mean. So many people lost their job. Then he says, did you or any person in, the, in your family or whatever close to you lose their job? Well, yeah, actually, it was my uh, uncle. Yeah. And uh, I said, okay, the other thing is, did you think we were making fun of your uncle? Or did you think we were making fun of the people who perpetrated the misdeed. Yes. He said, and the person said, oh, yeah, I guess it was the perpetrators. Oh, by the way, we all thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> so, so here's a clue. When a refiner has an objection to an idea or someone's complaining about an idea, ask them to be specific because you can't, you can't fix a generality. But just ask questions that will lead to what specifically was wrong with it. Get it down to a tiny, tiny enough thing where you can fix it or you can make them see how absurd their critique is. Yeah, keep going. It's almost ask why again. Ask why. Well, why would that bother them? Why would that keep going? I love it. And it's also, did you do a lawyer appreciation night? That was pretty ridiculous. That got people upset, but it was great. Yeah, Mike did that one. Mike and that one. Uh, Yes. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things got people upset. But a lot of people liked mimes. But a lot of people hated mimes, it turns out. Mike did Silent Night, where mimes uh, aped the umpires. You know, somebody was safe, the minds would jump up on top of the dugout and reenact the play. By the third inning, the fans were booing the mimes. And by about the fifth inning, somebody pelted one of the mimes with a fully loaded hot dog. And then the air was filled soon with food items throwing at the mimes. Yeah. And that turned out to be the biggest concession night ever. So even a failure can be a great success in some metric. Or it creates a great story. I mean, this past season, our, our rivals, the bacon, Mike and Bacon Bacon, so we did douse the bacon. So we gave all the fans water balloons to throw water balloons at a few people dressed up in bacon costumes. <laughs> but they kept drilling all the season ticket holders in the front rows. They were just getting soaked on the back oh, of their no. So they weren't too happy about it, but people were laughing and they were telling stories. So this is this is fascinating. I mean, I like a lot of these inspiration has come from you. And, you know, I think about the world's largest tickets. You know, we created tickets the size of huge posters. We thought it'd be a great idea. The fans were like, this is the yeah. most inconvenient ticket we could ever have. We can't put it in our pocket. <laughs> we can't put it in our purse. And you do things like that. But you know what? I think any brand, any team, you don't want to be irrelevant. You don't, any company. And you become irrelevant when you stop doing things that are at least a little different, funny, unique. And I think that's one of the big things that obviously you teach everybody that you've worked with. Is that correct? Absolutely. And one of the things that's really a lot of fun, too, is making up products that have absolutely no purpose or no use, but are really stupid. Because over time, what happens is you find a use for it. I'll give you an example. I have a pharmaceutical. I don't like the drug ads. Say it's an allergy ad and somebody's running around in a slow motion and then she gets to be with her grandkids because she took this uh, allergy medication. And then somebody underneath is saying the side effects are your going to throw up and they're kind of hiding that they're suppressing it and I, I thought well what if we made that the star the side effects put it into the foreground and I have a drug called Zydefex Z-Y-D-E-F-E-X Zydefex and it doesn't do a thing for you it's all side effects and then instead of hiding the side effects I made up a rap song for it very short, but you want to hear it? Everyone does, yes. Some common side effects. You'll break your neck, a poke in the eye, projectile vomiting, a common thing. You think you might die, then diarrhea comes right out your bum and up to the sky. Some common side effects, you die. <laughs> but I'm sure that product would be a big seller. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about like, because one of the things you do is when you have an opposite, you, then you ask, how could this be true? In what way could it be true? 
Well, in most drug tests, the uh, double blind test, the placebo outperforms yes. the drug, right? And I imagine somebody's already got the trademark placebo. So with Zydefex, I would think we could do a placebo kind of a pill. And given the statistics, I would think it would work for a rather large percentage of the people. <laughs> it'd, be a great, it'd be a great gift, too. It'd be a big winner there. Well, you came oh, up yeah. with also, was it the snot rag? Oh, was yes. It? Well, there's a pure opposite. The 1987 Twins won the World Series, and you would wave a thing called the Homer Hanky. And the Homer Hanky was fine. Everybody loved it. Millions of people bought them, and it's a new merch item. But the problem, I thought, was, well, wait a minute. You can't wave your Homer Hanky when the other team is up. You want them to strike out, right? So I came up with the strikeout snot rag. And that was, I don't know, I, I did it pretty late. I sold maybe 1,500 of them. And there's a bar in Maui that has a strikeout snot rag framed on its wall. <laughs> and, but what you do is you wave the snot rag at the other team to get them to strike out. Uh, and it was pretty disgusting. It was a big kind of a greenish glob of something on there. Well, well you, might see, out of. you might see something from the bananas next year. It's inspiring some ideas of thinking of rod and rags and socks and other things that we could have oh. going in during the game. This is really Beautiful. cool. I know we're coming to our end, Alan, but let's do a little quick innovation showdown. All right. Okay. All right. Let's say uh, I'll name a, a type of business. And what are some things that we could do this opposite effect to think differently? Like, so for instance, a group that's very creative, a brewery, there's tons of breweries. I've owned. How would you, if you were going to open a brewery, what were some ways you would think creatively about how you sell it or promote it? Well, I think one of the things immediately, the most obvious thing is craft beer now. Breweries are small and everything is, you're pairing beer with foods now and it's getting pretty precious. Yes. And so I would probably come out with a beer called Swill or something like that, or maybe Phlegm perhaps, kind of a thicker beer, and just something really awful, and then promote it as a craft beer with a straight face. That, that'd be the first thing I would think of. Because you think of a craft, you think of what, what's the opposite of well-crafted, you know, yeah. beer. Yeah, exactly, a beer. And uh, <laughs> well done, Jesse. Uh, the other thing I might do is I'd look for a demographic group that a beer is like a t-shirt these days. The barrier to entry is no longer there. Any, anybody can set up a craft brewery. Yeah. So now you're just dealing with the intellectual property part of it, the fun stuff. And so you might have passive aggressive beer for Minnesotans, you know, or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, so down there, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little upset about that, you know. Uh, I love it. So, uh, I love it. You, you right. can do, yeah. There's a bunch of opportunities. There are always a bunch of opportunities. one more for you? Yeah. All right. And, and Airbnb. So obviously, everyone kind of harps on the differences of Airbnbs. But if you're just going to open up an Airbnb, how would you think differently or the opposite using that? Well, probably the first thing I'd do is I would open up an Airbnb for pets. <laughs> so uh, Everyone's doing humans. I'm going to go animals. That's right. Because everybody wants to look at cat videos and dog videos. And so what I would do is build little dog houses full of miniature furnitures and put apron on furniture and put aprons on the dogs and things like that and just make a bunch of videos. And instead of boarding your pet at a kennel, I would do an Airbnb and uh, hopefully I could build it some kind of a neighborhood, maybe make a little tiny house out of it. You know, everything's miniature. One of the things I want to do, I was living in Sacramento, and one of the suburbs of Sacramento is Folsom. And so I wanted to do the Folsom Puppy Prison. So, so in other words, instead of being nice to puppies, because they're the most precious things ever, do something that's mean to puppies, but actually you're being nice to them. All right. Now we just lost everyone who loves puppies. So yeah, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. We're going to be nice to hamsters. No, but I, I think the framework is literally just look so far on the other direction and then, you know, work with the advancers, you know, realize the refiners and then get to the executors and you might have something that will stand out. There's too many meat businesses out there. There's too many people doing things the same way. So I'm going to finish here with a, uh, well, I gotta, I'll go the opposite. I'm going to flip the script here. Okay. You're now the host of Business yes. Differently. You can ask me one question. Okay. So I'm the host, right? 
Yes. Have you ever seen such a good looking host in your life? And, <laughs> and what depends on your answer is whether this gets actually into the podcast or just gets trashed. So <laughs> be gentle. Good looking guy, right? <laughs> what a question to ask. I will say this. I don't want to build up your head. I've never maybe met with someone that's so full of life and so bringing energy years into your experience and years into your life and still thinking differently. I think a lot of people get the creative thrown out of them. They keep having to go, this is the way you're supposed to do it. And you are still pushing the envelope, still pushing the boundaries. And to that, I think it does make you pretty attractive, my friend. Oh, well, that's very kind of you. And actually, I'm only 31 years old. It's just that I've got a lot of miles on me. So. <laughs> well, you're looking strong. You're looking strong. <laughs> All right. I want to finish with two questions yeah. here. You know us in the Savannah Bananas, and we're trying to obviously do everything that's crazy and going bananas. I'd love to hear your definition of what does going bananas mean to you? Well, it means everything you're doing, breaking the mold, doing complete radical thinking, changing the game, turning it around. I think, too, one of the things that you made me think of is that you've done so many off-the-wall things. Just as a joke on yourself, you could do something really mundane and then promote it as, this is our best idea ever. Oh, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, we're serving hot dogs in the ballpark. Ooh. So could you kind of tell me how that's a big idea? Well, God, nobody's ever done it before. In other words, you could make fun of yourself. Well, you said you that something. Before, lower expectations makes you different. So you said instead of hyping, go the opposite, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Or that's another one. It's, well, actually, this worked. Uh, we did this with an apartment complex, and we said it was called Arboretum Villages. And the headline was, we're going to tell you our name maybe in Arboretum is like a forest. We're going to tell you our name, maybe Arboretum Villages, but there's not one mature tree in the whole place. <laughs> and we filled the apartment building up just with that. <laughs> so, yeah, the self-effacing thing, hype everything that's wrong. Yeah, we could do the most boring night in sports. That's the oh, yeah of who we are, which would be yeah. very tough. That would go against every part of my existence to create a boring ballpark. But uh, there's something. Well, you know what you could do yeah. is just have a regular baseball game. Oh, <laughs> you know, I feel that way. Hey, it's like everyone else. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, all right. This is great, Alan. We could go on for a while, but I want to finish one final question. What makes someone unforgettable? Oh. I, I think, you know, it's the same principle again and again. And I think a lot of it is to do the things that nobody would do. My favorite comedians are self-effacing. Rodney Dangerfield, who was, I thought, very funny, especially at the end of his career, he gets no respect. I actually once had to call him and tell him that he was going to do a cheap commercial for these dentists that I was working with, ignore your teeth and they'll go away. And they said, oh, we don't want Rodney Dangerfield. They said, are you kidding? He's doing it for like 1500 bucks. I had to call him back and say, Rodney, you know how you don't get no respect? Well, I'm here to, I'm here to prove it to you. <laughs> You've just been turned down by three dentists. Good luck with that. But anyway, self-effacing humor, making fun of yourself. It's like an underdog thing. It's, it's the hidden underdog story. People who make fun of themselves, the human mind wants to go the other way. Mm. This guy must be really good if he's got the confidence to make fun of himself. Mm. That's so smart. So become unforgettable by doing something other people won't do. And don't be afraid to poke fun at yourself. Have fun. Have fun. And, you know, not really worry what people think, it sounds like. That's been a big part of your success. Yes. And especially because I tried worrying about what they think, and that just didn't work out well at all. <laughs> so. uh, well, Alan, this has been an absolute pleasure. One of my favorite conversations. and. Uh, so, so it was it was great and you know i think there's a lot of resources that people can learn more especially this care assessment what to do because now we're all inspired by these crazy ideas what next is there any ways you know you can guide them obviously to your books where else can they learn more about this i've got some partners and we're doing a uh, hoodoo method thing and we've got maybe a hundred some podcasts in the can and what you can do is you can learn how to do this method pretty much on your own just by going through the podcast and part of the fun of that is the titles are all parodies of best-selling business books like uh if you heard of what color is your parachute yes same cover but it doesn't matter what color your parachute is if it doesn't open <laughs> a bunch of things like that and so they're fun 
and it's myself and Carla Nelson, who's the host of the podcast. And we've got maybe 20 different podcasts that you can pretty thoroughly learn how to do this with. And uh, I'll give you some contact info and I can help people with assessments and things like that if they want. Awesome. That would be outstanding. Well, Alan, thank you, man. You have uh, certainly, certainly brought it today. You showed up and brought the energy and the fun and you know, thank you for being different and making a huge difference for me and everyone else. And thank you for doing that too, Jesse. You've created some incredible things. You've taken the whole idea of having fun and put it on steroids. And what I love about it is you'll do everything. You'll try everything. And you have that. You, look at you. You're unforgettable. A yellow tuxedo and a hat. Come on. <laughs> The master, you've taken all this stuff and added your own touches to it and made it brilliant. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Business Done Differently, where we believe that challenging the status quo, creating fans first and changing the game is the best way to grow your business. For more information about the guest and topics covered in this episode, visit findyouryellowtux.com or shoot me a note at jesse at findyouryellowtux.com. Until next time, stop standing still, start standing out.